In which case, our life is a lot easier, a lot simpler, because you can, you know, if you're able to walk out of the plane, you could just get close to a road and help us, you know. I think people are very excited when they see a plane in English. A lot of people are going to stop more. Most likely they will stop at least to see what's going on. You know? <laughs> and some of them might actually help us. Most people are helpful. But help will, will you know, that, that this would be the ideal scenario. The next scenario would be, you're not really next to a road, but you know, like we already spoke about, if you're flying, you're thinking about how far away is my nearest uh, village, town, you know, a civilized place where I can get help. So if you have a general idea on where you are, we sh which we should as pilots, because we're navigating, we should know at any given point in time where exactly we are and where I can go for help. In which case, then you can actually think about, okay, I've got this general direction that I can actually, I'm good to go, I'm going to go that way and get help. And if you've got your chart, just your simple VFR chart must still work pretty good, even if you're on the ground, to some degree, I'm sure. Yes. Just one quick thing, like you said, landing on a road is good, but like... No, not on a road, but near a road. Near <laughs> road you know. In Florida, they tell, teach us to worry about the ocean and the Gulf, is that if your engine dies in the water, you've got to find the nearest like, ship or cruise ship to find. Oh, if yeah. you're, if yeah. you're going down on the water, it's yeah. kind of the same thing. You're right, you're right. See, I used to fly quite a lot in Europe, and we used to do this um, across the English Channel. Yeah. Uh, I used to fly a left 410, going into Europe and back, in and out. And our route was actually over the shipping route. You know, when I was flying, mm -hmm. I, every flight, we'd, you know, me and my, my co-pilot, we'd see all these ships over, and we'd always talk about this as well. We'd think, if a plane goes down, we're going to put it right next to the ship over there. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So I, I think that that is a really good thing that you brought up over there. So really, some some form of highway where there is you know a lot of uh, traffic going on. Yeah. And when I went to Seattle, they actually have on the map the ferry routes. Right. Because you know if you're by there, they see you go down. Because you can follow the ferries if your visibility gets low. You can see the ferries crossing. You know exactly right. where you're at. I think I think it's a really good idea to think about that really. because I think there is. Some level, I mean, I think your chances of surviving and getting help increases substantially if we do that, rather than putting it somewhere where nobody's going to find it. I know somebody who did that, and I'm going to show you something. Another scenario where that happened, and we'll see what happens that time. So, so here's a scenario where you're, you're not really near civilization. Okay? You're in the wilderness. Wilderness typically, by definition, is where you don't have you know, modern, modernization at all, whatsoever. And people have, we've, we've managed to leave these parts of the earth as they are. You know, this beautiful place. Do you know where this is? Like Any South guesses? Huh? It's actually the wilderness, wilderness of Judah, where in the Bible, Jesus actually goes there for 40 days and 40 nights. And, uh -huh. yeah, that's interesting, yeah. And this one here is another type of wilderness, quite the opposite, right? It's lush green. Any guesses on this? Amazon. Who said that? Where? Amazon. Oh, is it? Uh -huh. yeah. Actually, it's it? like that up in northern Wisconsin. We flew in northern Wisconsin. Just like that? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. But it's beautiful, isn't it? But that is yeah, but for thousands of thousands of square miles. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, where do you land? It's like, <laughs> you got to land in a lake. So, oh, I land right. in the water. Where else would yeah. you land there? That's what I've been saying. Except you might get eaten by a piranha. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, wherever you, if, if you land safe and safely, and you manage to walk away from the plane, there are other challenges now. You know, in places like this, it's a serious challenge. And and then that is when your mental preparedness and your physical preparedness really kicks in. It makes a big difference on you surviving, even if you manage to put the plane down safely. Uh, in a scenario like that, let's say that you do have to land, and one of the fellows said, you know, we land in the water. However. Depending upon the aircraft you're flying, I have a retractable gear, but a lot of people do not. So I don't think it'd be a good idea to go in that water with a retract uh, with a uh, fixed gear. You know, it's yeah. I, see, I think I think there's enough. I think there's a lot of uh, literature out there now saying that uh, our uh, fixed gears do not flip necessarily. It's not a, it's not a it's given that you're going to land. It's a technique, of course. Right. A sure. big part is the technique of landing. You get slow, you get the tail down, etc., etc. So I, I really slow. 
Okay, yeah. I mean, you don't want to stall yeah. as the old story, but still, you, you can do and, and I've even heard literature where they say you could actually take it really low on the water and actually mm -hmm. stall the plane in the, and, and get the wheels down rather than flipping it. Yeah. yeah, so they're all, oh, really? I mean, I think, I think really you have to think about what's, you know your plane better than anybody else. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a judgment call of what. Uh, a good example is your flight uh, 1549. Do you know which one I'm talking about? 1549. Uh, it's a very, very famous flight that. In the Hudson Bay? Or, okay. Yeah. Scully. That was Scully, yes. That, that was a, a typical judgment call, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right after takeoff. Where do you turn? What's the best place to put the plane down? I've got so many passengers mm -hmm. on board. Sure. He becomes a national hero. Yeah. Right. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Put it on the, the river. Point is, Fitzy, well, where would you land other than the water? Look yeah. at that jungle. You know, there is a joke. I'm sure many of you have heard about this joke. They say, especially at night time. Yeah, turn off the lights. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or if you if you switch on your lights and you see what you what you don't like, it starts to rain. Oh, that's the old joke. Like that. No, seriously, Vince. You know, you're you're commenting about the water. I understand, but where would you land in that jungle? Mm -hmm. I think you're going to make yes, it. Kevin? Kevin? There is a technique that you can stall it in the trees. I have no things that so weird. Would you say, would you repeat that, please? There is a technique where you can get the airplane and you basically stall it into the trees. So trees, into the they're trees. They're kind of breaking your fall. That if you have any airspeed going forward, then the trees are going to be That's your canopy. No, oh, you see, it's interesting you say that because I've heard also about uh, some new technique that you actually do. You watch, you, you look for the trees and go between the big trees and let that plane dive in and let the trees take your wings, which will stop you very quickly, and therefore you settle down pretty easily. Uh, well, I, 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 and I think, I really think it boils down to the scenario. I don't think one, there is no one single fits all. You, I think we have to really make the judgment call. Mm -hmm. on the By the way, how many would go into the water here? I would. I would. Uh, I would. I would. I'd take the water. The hunter would take the water. The trees, you know, you're stuck in the path of the trees, now what are you going to do? Then again, it depends. And in uh, Amazon, I, would, I might actually, I might actually aim for the trees. You know? I don't know, there are piranhas in there, they're going to chew me out. That's the city. That's the city. That's the city. You definitely don't want to get there. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to talk about a few facts that might actually get us thinking about, so, you know, helping us with a, with a survival plan. Let's see what they are. Some of the limitations for us, human limitations. So this limitation I'm going to talk about is the, the, the number three rule. It's a pretty interesting thing. How long can you hold your breath, by the way? <laughs> that depends on, of course, all these things depend on individual fitness, of course. You know, how fit are you and how much... Have, or swimming have you been doing and exercising and so on and so forth. But it says actually the average, don't try this at home. <laughs> <laughs> the average human being is, 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 uh, is said to have, is capable of perhaps uh, surviving without air for three minutes roughly. That's a plus or minus of course, that really depends on the individual. There are world record holders who hold it for much, much longer. And uh, we're not talking about, I don't know how many world record holders are there over here who can hold their breath longer, but <laughs> Unfortunately, that guy died. The rope. He was diving and he, he died. Free, free diving? Yes. Uh, that's a dangerous sport. <laughs> but uh, that guy seems pretty calm. Uh, mm -hmm. What about what about doing something like this? Yeah. I, 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 <laughs> he was a deep, 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 nine hundred feet or something, and he never made it. <laughs> yeah. I don't think he wanted to die. <laughs> See, we're talking about without shelter. Actually, people <clears throat> think shelter is you know something, a roof on top of your head. Actually, what, we, what is meant by shelter is your temperature control of your body. That's what we're talking about. Okay. Because uh, your physical, uh, biological temperature control has got a lot to do with whether you're going to live or die. Your survival depends on that. And if you don't have, if you lose heat very rapidly, what do you think is your time frame before you pass out? So we have three minutes for oxygen and breathing. What do you think about shelter? About that long. In three hours. Water. In the water, three hours during the last three hours? Or not, time? and that depends, of course. We're not talking about that scenario there. That hypothermia hits you in seconds. That's right. right. Okay. Yeah. I'm giving you an extreme scenario over there. I'm, uh, so on the, if, if you're, of course, these are all based on where you are. Something like that, you will die in minutes. But if you are in a cold area, for example, okay. 
right? Uh, with not much protection, and you're losing body heat very rapidly. I think three hours is an outer limit for most people. You know, you and we talk about the survival gear, uh, which you didn't mention, and so, uh, regarding water also. I never hear of carrying an oxygen it's mask. Oh, oxygen mask. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, why would you have it? Why, why worry about two, three minutes in the water when you put oxygen mask in your di ditch? And you can be underwater for an hour, two hours. <laughs> no, seriously. I mean, why yeah, isn't it a, a, yeah, it's possible, why not? an important, uh, an absolutely indispensable part of uh, someone who flies over water? Anyway, yeah, yeah. I would think so. What about water? How long can you survive without water? Without drinking water? Three days without water. Huh? Three, three days. Yeah, again, that, that, that again is, you know, three days, three days is, is the average. Some people can survive more. Some people can survive less, Absolutely. and that really depends on the individual fitness as well. You know, dehydration is a big killer. However, yeah. so it's really important for you to carry water. And what about food? How long can you survive without food? We already spoke about the wilderness no. of Judah, and somebody stayed there for 40 days. I think about a month at least. 30 days. Yeah, plus or minus. And you can read a lot about these things. You know, there's so many different variations to how 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 long you can stay without food. But I think that really depends on you. Depends on body fat as well. Yeah. And, and your, yeah, so many different factors. But I think it's a good idea for us to think about these things. How long have I got before things start shutting down? And that might give us some planning time, right? So, what's the plan of action? Should we have a plan of action? I think as pilots we normally do. So let's see what plan of action. And, and also based on a timeline as well. And that's really important for us to have a plan of action, not forever, but we have to have certain timelines fixed on how you can execute it as well. So let's see how that works. So this is an interesting number five here. So the five minute, five hour, and a five day. Now you think five days? Might happen, who knows? So let us see this number five timeline. So for a five minute, what do you do if you're able to land and you manage, you're able to walk away from the plane safely, what do you do in the first five minutes of this happening? What could we do? The first thing you want to do is do a head count. If it's just you, I think it's easy to count. <laughs> but if you're, carrying, if you're carrying a lot more than just yourself, I think it's really important for you, first of all, know who is, who's managed to walk out of the plane and, uh, and who's not because you might want to then start searching for something. The head counts are very important. The first thing you want to do when you walk out of the plane. The next thing you want to do is you want to check for, are you able to breathe well? Are your passengers or anybody that's around you, is there any breathing trouble? Breathing is really important because if you can't breathe because of the impact or, or the crash, then some, something terrible is, is to fall. So you want to make sure you're able to breathe. And you also want to check for any bleeding or injuries as well. Accidents can cause severe injuries very often than not. And some of them can be fatal if they're not. And a, and a lot of times, you can actually do something about it if you're known about it. And so it's important for us to figure out, okay, is there, is there a bleeding that can be arrested? Because very often, just arresting bleeding can save a life. So that's important for us to figure out. You know, there is a, uh, the American Heart Association, and uh, Many, many years ago, they developed a, uh, I don't know if you've heard about basic life support and advanced life support. A lot of doctors, nurses in the hospital industry, they actually get trained on this. Um, so I'm just going to tell you quickly what a, a basic life support is. They have a, um, the primary ABC of cardiopulmonary resuscitation. What is that? ABC, A is for airways. Same thing as we discussed, check your airway. Make sure nothing is blocking your capacity to breathe. Are you breathing? So if B is breathing spontaneously, if nothing is blocking your airways, are you breathing spontaneously, automatically, or if you're not? <coughs> yeah, and that is important to determine whether you're able to do that on your own, or do you need, do you need to give assistance to help them breathe? Spontaneous breathing is important. And C is finally circulation. And that comes into the whole thing about are you breathing somewhere? If your heart beating all right, check for a pulse. Pulse is a good indicator for blood circulation, right? You can check for pulse is only based part of the body and see if it's, if your heart is still working, if the blood is still circulating. If it's not, then you're losing somebody very quickly. And that is a really important factor as well to check. If you're able to do that, it's a good idea for you to do this. 
the basic life support techniques are very, very critical. There we go. Now, ELTs, who can tell me what, what, what is required for an ELT to get acti activated? ELT to get activated, what do you need to do? Impact, right? Push the power button, you can activate it yourself. Yes, yeah. if you have an activated by impact, then you can activate it manually as well. Yeah. Go ahead and switch, switch it on. Hopefully, you, you know, it, it, it's not such a bad thing if you're not activated by impact, which means you're not exceeded maybe 5 Gs. Most of these ELTs, I think they, they work with some, something in that range. I think they require about 4 or 5 Gs to activate. Yeah. If you're going down, should you hit the button? I don't think you're going to have the time if you if it's not right on in the front. <laughs> no, I think you've got other things to worry about. If, it, if it's right there in, in, in your uh, on, on the dashboard, yeah, why not? Yeah, absolutely. That's again a judgment call. You know, if you've got the time to be, if you're able to divide your attention to that and do something, why not? Absolutely. But if you did not, and if you then walked away from it, this would be a good source for you to get additional help. Then people are going to spot you. And if you're carrying a personal locator beacon like that device, there are many available in the market. That would be a good time to activate that as well. There are really fancy watches that have these personal locator beacons. They sell these. Yeah. Very cool. The next thing, after you've done all of this in the first five minutes, is to actually then call for help. Now, that really depends also whether you're going to be able to call for help or not. So for example, very often, you know, we're talking about a scenario where you're, you don't have immediate notes in nearby. How, what is the possibility of you actually ha having a uh, reception on your cell phone? If you get any reception, you're lucky. That one over there, I don't know if you recognize what that is. Satellite it's a sat phone. A what kind of phone? Satellite phone. Satellite phone, yeah. Now that is, actually you can use it anywhere in the world, most parts of the world. It's, you know, it used to be very expensive, it's not, it's not that expensive anymore, you know, and even if it's not, if it's not something that you want to invest on, satellite phones are available for rental, actually. Many companies yeah. rent them. So you don't have to actually own one. If you think you're flying over an area which, which is, you know, over a wilderness area and uh, you need something for an emergency, you can actually rent one of them. And it'll come in handy. So the next thing is, this, what you want to be doing is you want to be trying and calling for help. Okay. So let's say you've done all of this, you're ready to go, you got, you know, you, we already have a scenario here where you're actually in the middle of nowhere. So I would be extremely doubtful that somebody's going to come and pick you up the next five minutes. Right. So you got <laughs> wishful thinking. But you got time in hand now, so we can do something. Right. So what do we do the next five hours? Shelter, as we spoke about. See this. Remember, I told you shelter is not just about. It's not just about a roof over your head, it's about regulating your body temperature. You want to keep warm. So you want to try and see how you're going to protect yourself against the against the against against nature that can actually take you down very quickly in order to protect you. So try and build a shelter for yourself. That would be a good idea to start with you know, once you've got additional time. Now that you've done all of that, then you can reevaluate injuries. Maybe you you know there was if somebody was hurting an ankle. You might want to go back and check and see is it swollen more after the first five minutes. Maybe it's a fracture. Maybe you might have support. Right? Has your has the bleeding stop that you put pressure on or it start bleeding again? You know because in the in the moment of all of this excitement uh, and anxiety, we tend to miss things. So it's good for us to plan for these things. So checking. So that guy is just a real fuss you know, <laughs> Some of us might be like that, but then again, you see, uh, it's a good thing to reassess injuries anyway. Then you want to actually take stock of what you have with you. Your inventory. What am I carrying with me? That's, that's a very uh, very deceiving inventory list that you might carry in your aircraft. But you know, it would be quite handy if you have them. But you really want to know how much water are you carrying, how much uh, food is available, how long is it going to last. This is the type of thing. What is available? If you have the skills to build a fire, that might be a good time to start something. Because actually, if you're not carrying matches, building fire with friction takes a very long time. <laughs> actually, if, if the temperature is going down and the night is coming, approaching, 
you really want to be starting on this quite early on. 